but again, in the meantime, you can't just sit back and sit and wait for it. You gotta, you gotta keep moving. And that's where we've been very blessed to have amazing people around us. We've been able to create a great process for connecting with our students. We've actually just literally on Friday, we created a whole new uh, communications calendar where, you know, we do different uh, events and, you know, we're doing a lot of thing on, things on our YouTube channel where we're able to connect more and more with our, with our community. So it's been, it's been a journey. It really has. But I think if you keep learning and, you know, taking the feedback, then uh, I think those are the companies that will survive. And if you survive times like this, that's where you then have that explosive growth when you come out of it, which uh, obviously all entrepreneurs are always dreaming of. <laughs> Talking with the experts. Hello and welcome to Talking with the Experts. My name is Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. And Talking with the Experts is about all things business by business owners for business owners. And you can find it on all good podcasting streaming platforms and on YouTube. And today my guest is Daniel Wood from Sweden. And his business is about... Property investing and uh, event uh, management and all sorts of things. And he's got his fingers in all sorts of little pies. So uh, welcome, Daniel, and um, thank you for joining me today. And yeah, we'll just have a bit of a discussion about how you started and, um, and what's going on in your life at the moment. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. A real honor to be here on the show and uh, be considered an expert. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, we've had, we've had a journey and I say we, me and my wife, Gisela, we run all our companies together and we've had a journey. You know, I, both of us were in, in corporate and uh, regular companies. Uh, when we realized that uh, it was actually when we got our first son, William, uh, we realized that if we would go kind of the regular nine to five or nine to five plus route that, that we were on, we realized he would actually be spending more time at daycare with his teachers than he would be spending time with us, his parents. And that meant I would have strangers influencing my son's future more than we were. And that wasn't really, really what we wanted. So we started looking for other options, other opportunities, and we landed on property investing because we just got really excited about being able to invest in property, buying a house, renting it out, providing a home for someone, and also getting that passive income coming in every month. Uh, we study the market. So we live in Sweden. I'm born here, raised here. I apologize for my accent. That's my dad's fault. He's from the US. Uh, <laughs> but I'm born and raised in Sweden. But we looked at the market here and it just wasn't very conducive to investing. It's, not, it's very regulated and hard. So we looked around Europe and we realized the UK is probably the easiest market in Europe to invest in. And uh, we were very lucky to find a very skilled mentor to come and help us out. The one mistake we did, and one thing I, I've learned now, and I've, I've spoken a lot to amazing people about this, is you, when you look for a mentor, you want to find someone that's done the same journey that you have, has had challenges and setbacks, and has overcome them. And so we found a mentor that was British and was investing in the UK, you know, a stone's throw from his office. So he knew the UK market inside and out. He knew how to do a deal there, but he didn't know how to do a deal from a thousand miles away. <laughs> and that's the difference. So there were a lot of things that he kind of, you know, skipped over in the lessons because, you know, he just hadn't experienced it. You know, he, he knew that he would walk by on a walk every day and check out how the builders were doing. I, a thousand miles away, I'm obviously not doing that. So I need to have different systems that I didn't learn. And uh, so our journey started us by, started out by us getting ripped off for about 400,000 um, pounds. It was builders, it was partners or so-called partners, I should say, and different people. And 400,000 pounds was not money we had. We'd been kind of the perfect students and gone out and raised investor capital, put that together 
And it takes time and property to realize how much, you know, if you've lost money, you know, because we were getting like fake build reports, fake, you know, project reports. So we thought we were doing really, really well. We were building our empire. And then things started kind of coming out one by one. And we realized that, wait a sec, these projects are not where they claim to be. And uh, when we went back and tried to kind of figure things out, we realized we were down 400,000 pounds in the hole, which is uh, obviously a little bit of a problem. <laughs> um, and so actually when we were going through this, I, mean, I was stressed out of my mind. You know, I, I barely slept for probably a six month period. And right, you know, towards the end of it, my, my accountant called me and said, Daniel, I got some bad news. It is time to bankrupt your company. And for me, that was that that's for us in Sweden, that's the kiss of death. If you bankrupt the company, you're you're done. There is no more being an entrepreneur. That's it. You have one shot. And uh, it's not the same, obviously, in the US, where you're expected to bankrupt three companies before you succeed. It's a little bit better in the UK, but but in a lot of Europe, it's really if you bankrupt the company, you're a failed entrepreneur, go back and get a job. And so I it was one of those like, oh the, okay, what what does this mean? And he said, well, what we'll essentially do is we'll bankrupt the company, we'll write off all this debt, and then we'll set up a new company. You start over from there. I'm like, wait, you're saying I can start over? He's like, yeah, just take all the lessons you've learned and then do it again and do it right. Wow, that, that, sounds, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. Um, but then I asked one question, and this kind of, this was the fateful question where I asked, so if we don't pay that debt, who does? And he said, well, I mean, your investors are probably not going to see much of their money back. I said, ah, so you're not saying we should, you know, start over. You're essentially saying I should throw everyone else under the bus. He said, well, I guess that's another way of putting it. He said, well, all right, we can't do that. He said, well, how are you going to turn it around? I have no idea, but we're not bankrupting the company. We're going to figure this out. And that's where we got really blessed because as you mentioned, we run an event company as well here in Sweden. And we started that during this journey because we were out internationally learning from all these amazing people traveling. And that was because no one was coming to Sweden. <laughs> and there are lots of great entrepreneurs here. I mean, amazing companies have been starting and started in Sweden. Just look at Spotify and Ikea to name two right off, right off the top of everyone's head. Everyone knows them. Those are Swedish companies. And, but no, none of these like corporate teachers were coming to Sweden, these uh, business uh, gurus, so to speak. So we started an event company. We actually brought Kim Kiyosaki to Sweden. We brought, brought Randy Zuckerberg to Sweden and lots of other amazing people. And we got to know the speakers. We actually got to know Kim Kiyosaki and we talked to her about what we were going through. And she gave us some great advice for kind of how to turn some of these projects around. We had to go back and restructure the debt. We had to go back and renegotiate with, with builders. We had to raise new capital to kind of infuse into the projects. And she helped us with structures there. We worked with Randy Zuckerberg and her team who gave us great advice on, you know, how to scale the business. And, and essentially what we had to do was we had to do enough good deals to compensate for this kind of anchor, this lead weight that was holding us down. And, and it literally took us years to do, but with the help of all these amazing people, and there are dozens more, more than I can ever begin to thank. Um, well, we, we were able to turn it around and we have a nice portfolio today and we have uh, developments, we have uh, direct property we own and rent out. We're actually the founding investor in a golf resort in South Wales. So we've done things, but the, the kind of the upshot of all this is that, yes, we went through the, the investment journey and we got to the other side, but had, had it just been us, had I had the 400,000 pounds to lose there at the outset, no one would have known about this. It would have been just been me and Gisela doing our thing and no one would have known. But because the investors were involved and we had to update them and let them know that, well, look, we've screwed up. This is what's happened. We're going to try to turn it around. And then coming back, you know, quarter by quarter and going like, hey, it's a little better. Hey, it's a little better. Hey, you're going to have to give us more time, but we're working on it. And just that consistent all of a sudden people saw how these kind of these updates got more and more positive as time went by and that we were getting, you know, we're getting to this point. And what happened then was that, you know, they were talking about it. People knew we were screwing up originally and they knew we were turning it around and they then knew we had turned it around. And that, that caused people to start reaching out and kind of say, Hey, look, I'm on the same journey you are. 
what do I need to look out for? Could you help me? Could you coach me? And originally we said like, no, no, that's, uh, you know, we did, we did this to spend time with my son. I've not spent time now. I've worked hard to get out of this. And now, now I want to, and now we have three sons, but um, at the same time, we knew what kind of the cliff they were running towards. And we said, well, you know what, of course we're going to help. And we started helping people out and they started having success. They avoided the mistakes we made. And, uh, you know, some of them could quit their jobs and move to Spain or just, uh, you know, travel or whatever else they wanted to do. It was so cool. And that's when we said, all right, we, we got to do this properly. And we set up Momentum Property Education together with uh, our, an amazing friend, one of the best investors I've ever met, a gentleman called Lukas Brzezinski. Uh, who came in, he's a risk management expert, which for obvious reasons, you understand why I appreciate. <laughs> and we partnered up and, and that became Momentum Property Education, where we've now helped hundreds of people kind of not make the mistakes we do, instead actually successfully buy and scale property portfolios. So it's been, it's been a journey and it's caused us to get into all these other industries, both, you know, First property, then running an event company, then running an education company, working with software, working with uh, marketing, where all these different parts. And it, it was basically centered around live events. And we talked about this a little before the show rose is that we went, we really got into this at the kind of tail. You know, we did the events business a couple of years. I think we started that in 2017, 2016. But the education company we started at the tail end of 2019. And uh, just as we were starting to do events, I was being invited all over Europe to come and speak. I was doing, you know, four or five different cities in Sweden. I was in Denmark. I was in Norway. We had an invite to Zurich, to South Africa, to Portugal. And then COVID came. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the whole business landscape changed. And we'd been working so hard. You know, I was literally out doing events four to, four to six days a week. So we were doing everything live. We had essentially zero online presence. And all of a sudden, the live world disappeared, right? <laughs> we're all stuck in our home. And we had to make that shift. And that's been such an exciting journey. We've shifted to, you know, get, getting on podcasts like this, speaking to amazing people like you, Rose, getting to connect with your amazing audience to take this time. And we've created our own podcast where we interview property experts from all over the world. And we have a Facebook community now. And of course, all our courses are digital now. And, and that's allowed us to provide much more value. We still have, you know, coaching. We still have Q&As and online. But it's, it, we can give so much more value in the less time. So it's been really, really exciting. Although our revenue took a 90% hit there right when COVID started. So that's kind of what we've done and how we got here. And uh, it's, it's been a journey, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. Um, yeah, I, I know that uh, COVID, it's been a blessing and it's been, in, in some ways, it's been a blessing because a lot of people weren't using the online space in, in a, a productive manner. And, um, you know, so many more podcasts now are out in the marketplace and, um, you know, people have had to change the way that they have meetings. So Zoom has, you know, improved uh, their product at, to no end just in a few months because, you know, Zoom is you know, the way to go normally, you know, when you want to meet with people. But, you know, it saves people money now because you don't have to travel, you don't have to hire a room and you don't have to get catering and all sorts of things. So in that's that way... That's a huge difference. Business, I mean, that's... Yeah, we, I mean, we were expected to go and meet someone, weren't we? You know, whenever it's mm. like, hey, can we jump on a phone call? Like, no, come, let's have a meeting. Mm. And it takes half the day to travel, get there, do the meeting, do the politeness. Now, no one expects that. Everyone's like, well, let's get on a Zoom call. And you're, you're in and out in meetings. You're so much more effective now, too. Absolutely, so yeah. Yeah, and I, and I quite enjoy it because I've, I don't um, normally go to networking events or, you know, and I should do, but I don't. I just <laughs> get a bit uncomfortable with them, you know. Just. But and you now know, you have an I've audience missed... of hundreds of people that you connect with every single week through the show. It, it really just changes the whole game. Yeah, and like I, this, I think you're about my 150 second interview in less than 12 months. So yeah, you know, yeah. and I've met 152 amazing people. It's mm. um, I wouldn't have met them otherwise. So, you know, to me, it's, this has been a blessing. So, 
Yeah, I think I think it's as with everything too. It's what's what's happened during COVID is obviously a lot a lot of businesses have shut down, and I mean in our industry, I mean the events industry, it's been totally, you know, crushed. Property investors have obviously generally done pretty well, so that that's that's lucky that we're kind of both. But for for companies that were pure event companies, they've been devastated. Yeah. But for those few that survive, what happens is now there's that much less competition. We've learned so much, you know, we've shifted to online, but that doesn't mean when the world opens up, we're not going to go back and do live events again, which means essentially we potentially doubled our revenue because now we have an online process and we have a live process and now we can do both. We've the, the ironic thing I want to say is, you know, we, we, I used to be out and I would meet people every single day, but we're actually much, much closer now to our students and to our community, even though I haven't met any of them for over a year. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we have, because Australia's um, quite open now, we, um, except for one state keeps getting yeah. COVID cases all the time, but we're having hybrid events um, and we you know we're finding them really, really successful. So, yeah. you know, if you can't, if you live interstate, you can still zoom into the, to a meeting. Oh, right. A, so it's a event. live event and then you're kind of Zoom casting mm. the event, broadcasting it as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And it's, um, it's been, um, I don't know, it's been awesome for a lot of event, event venue or companies that have done that. So, you know, if they're holding conferences or seminars or whatever, you know, you have the people that are actually in there in the room and then it's zoomed out to other people who, you know, can't travel or for whatever reason, or, you know, just don't want to travel, they can still zoom in. And it's really wonderful. And um, yeah, it's, uh, people have had to pivot that way to, to uh, get their event businesses up and going again. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We're looking forward to that. We're still, we're still in semi shutdown in Sweden. There are rules. I think you're only allowed to meet eight people at a time at, at what would be an event, which Basically, you know, we used to do, you know, our average event was around 100 people. So there's <laughs> there's a yeah. little while left. Yeah, there is. A there. lot of countries are like that, unfortunately. COVID is, um, it doesn't look like letting up anytime soon either. I will say, I'm, I'm hoping for the vaccines to kind of take hold and, uh, you know, let, let us go back to the normal. But again, in the meantime, you can't just sit back and sit and wait for it. You gotta, you gotta keep moving, and that's where Absolutely. we've been very blessed to have amazing people around us. We've been able to create a great process for connecting with our students. We've actually just literally on Friday we created a whole new uh, communications calendar where you know we do different uh, events, and you know we're doing a lot of thing on things on our YouTube channel where we're able to connect more and more with our, with our community. So it's been, it's been a journey. It really has, but I think if you keep learning and, you know, taking the feedback, then uh, I think those are the companies that will survive. And if you survive times like this, that's where you then have that explosive growth when you come out of it, which uh, obviously all entrepreneurs are always dreaming of. <laughs> oh yes, definitely. Definitely. Now, I guess, um, I, you know, I've got to ask this burning question. How did you get out of debt and um, how are the investors now? Well, so, so that's where the challenge really was, right? We, we had to go back and I had to have really, really tough conversations with the investors and kind of explain that, you know, essentially we'd lost their money and that, uh, you know, if they essentially I had to be blunt and say, look, if you want, it's your right to take the company to court and, and you know, declare us bankrupt. What will happen then is you'll get about 10 to 15 percent of your investment back after the cost of the court. But that's your prerogative. My plan is to somehow turn this business around, figure it out and then pay you back your investment. You're not going to walk away from this with a profit, but you're going to get something. And so essentially all the investors said, well, look, that's not really much of an offer you just gave me there, Daniel, but obviously I want my money back. And I said, well, yeah, sadly it is what it is, right? This is where we are. And, you know, we had the option to bankrupt the company. That would have been such an easy decision. I could have just hit that button, walk away from it and legally no, no problem, no, no harm, no foul. But in a kind of integrity standpoint, we said, no, that, that's not what we're going to do. 
And so we had to go back and kind of stop the interest because we, we were paying interest to the investors. So that yeah. was accumulating faster than what we were making. So I had to essentially say, no, that is now stopped. No more interest. We're, we're, we're going to build, you know, we're, we're, we're going to try to create income. And, and so that, that took care of the bleeding. I did go back to some of the investors and some of them were willing to take equity on like separate co- property deals that we'd done and, and stuff. So I could move some of the debt out into other projects and, and take it away from debt and make it into co-ownership. So essentially I sold equity and properties to, to get that done, but still we were left with a huge, huge shortfall even at that. So uh, the only thing we had left was really go out and do more deals. And uh, there we, we, try, we tried a lot of different things. But in the end, the, the simple thing was we partnered with someone in the UK uh, that had you know, decades worth of experience, that had the credibility. And then we had, a, a, you know, we had the ability to, to connect with people and get it out there. And so we basically said, look, you're not really investing with us. Um, you know, obviously we, we've kind of proven our integrity by not bankrupting the company, but we haven't really proven that we actually know what we're doing. <laughs> and so we said, well, look, you're going to partner with us and we're going to partner with our partner who does have the legitimate background. So you know that the project is going to go well. And that's how we kind of started turning it around. And that allowed us to start building up our reputation as investors because deals started going well. And then, you know, then, then that was how we had to do it. We had to go out and do one deal at a time, either, you know, at the beginning only with partners and then ourselves. And then over time, uh, we ended up doing over well over 100 property deals uh, to turn the game around. But uh, finally, we, we got to that point. Uh, because we've also come in, the, the kind of downside for us is we haven't come in in a flip market in the UK. Yeah, because it's very easy. You know, we could have made that money much, much faster if we bought, refurbed and sold. But we we were investing through, you know, the Brexit times when the market took a dip because of Brexit. And then, you know, the run up here and then, you know, COVID and everything. It's not really been a market to flip through. So the work for the past few years has really been buy a property, use equity to get investors out, get cash flow that can offset interest rates, and then slowly accumulate equity enough to, to start getting the investors out. So it's been a slow, steady slog, but that's, uh, that's how we've done. Uh, regarding the investors, it's a very, very mixed bag if you spoke to them. I mean, I think some, most of them would probably come back to you and say like, well, at least they got integrity. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them would say, well, but they, they're not very good investors. They screwed it up. <laughs> And, and, you know, that is their prerogative. It was our first deals. And, uh, you know, we, we don't apologize for it. We, well, we do apologize for it. I should say, I don't, I don't try to come with any other explanation. It's we screwed up and it was, we, we threw ourselves in uh, we had a mentor, we thought we were doing right. And, and it turned out we were not, and things went, went south very, very quickly. But I think most of them would, would say that, you know, they, they wouldn't, I, maybe they probably wouldn't recommend someone to invest with us. And, and I, I believe, you know, I, I completely understand why, but I don't think they would stop anyone from investing with us. Uh, I think they would say, look, it didn't go well for me, but at least I get my money back. Um, so, you know, take your chances. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's kind of it. I think that's all you can expect. I mean, I know, that a lot of people tell the stories about how they screwed up and then the investors are over the moon and they come back and they're throwing in millions into their companies. But in the end, I think if you've lost people that much money, they're not going to be trusting you in the first round again. It takes a while to build that trust back. And some of them are, some of them are looking at projects with us, you know, they're considering it, but I'm definitely not pushing them. I'm very, very careful, very, very respectful. And I think that's kind of how you have to treat it. We screwed up, but luckily we're, we've, we have been and have made amends. So, mm, Oh, that's good. Now, where can people find you, Daniel? Right. So there are multiple ways to connect with us. So kind of pick your, pick your poison <laughs> kind of thing. We're on YouTube where we do three shows a week. We talk about, uh, we have one on Tuesdays where we talk about the property market and the economy. We have our podcast that comes out on YouTube, but also on all podcast platforms. So you can find them 
the YouTube channel on Momentum Property Education, and the podcast is Momentum Investing. Uh, on Saturdays, we talk about passive incomes. So we have a passive income show. You can connect with us on Instagram, where you get a bit of a behind the scenes to meet us, see what's going on around the momentum and in the life of a property investor. Um, feel free to join our Facebook community, uh, International Property Investors, where it's a community of 1,500 investors. We do Q&As every single week or connect with us on Clubhouse, where we do more personal development style events. Um, our, our handle is Property Skills. The name is in me, Daniel Wood. And we've done, uh, we've done Clubhouse rooms with, uh, well, with Les Brown. We've had Tyrese Gibson. We've had Simon Zucci. A lot of amazing, amazing people join us there about personal development and how to grow. Perfect. And I guess, um, what's a, a final words of wisdom have you got to share? I think for me, the key has been, well, persistence. <laughs> persistence and, and never giving up, but especially also never believing that you know best, you know, kind of being humble enough to say, look, I have an idea. I like the idea. I'm going to try it out. And that's where in Silicon Valley, they often talk about what they call minimum viable product. You know, just get something good enough to present to the market. And then without your ego being involved, take the feedback. And we do that all the time now on the team where we'll We'll have an idea, we'll create maybe a course or a product or, or, or even just an, a, a registration page or something for the company. And, you know, everyone will be involved or they'll build their own version. And we're all, you know, we're all so proud of the version we've created, right? And this is going to be so good. But we always say, we always split test things. We always try out two versions, one that is, you know, maybe more conventional or, you know, the, the old version or whatever it might be. And one is the, the one where kind of our ego is saying, this is the one we want to win. And I'll, I'll tell you, 80% of the time, the other version wins. <laughs> and, and that's allowed us to get better, though, because every time we do that, we learn something. We see, all right, this one's working better. And, and we, we never, I think, being persistent, but daring to throw that mud against the wall, seeing what sticks without putting an ego into it, taking that and then trying to refine it further, create a new version, a new split test, a new test, throwing that at the wall and seeing what happens. And uh, we do that every single month. We do that on, on a lot of things we do. And every thing, single quarter, we go through every single student we have and say, well, why was this person successful? Why weren't they more successful? Why hasn't that person been successful? What would they have needed? And we take that review and say, look, if they haven't been successful, it's not their fault. It's our fault. And, and I think that's why we have such a high rate of people being successful. But then we ask the question, how do they become more successful <laughs> and what can we do? And so we're, we're actually right now going through a huge review of all our courses where we're improving certain aspects where we see if, if that student had only gotten that, they would have been able to blow it up even more. And, and I think that's taking the ego out, being persistent, trying things and taking the feedback to heart. I think if you do that, it might take longer than you want to be successful, but you'll always be successful in the end. Perfect. Perfect advice. Thank you. That's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, well, it's what we're doing. I'm, we're hoping it's the right advice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good advice too, because persistency is the key to a lot of things. And, and you do have to let your ego not... Uh, ride above everything else. You need to let the ego go. Yeah, because it yeah. can ruin. A well, lot especially of with how how often I'm wrong. Yes, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I let my ego play a role, then we don't have a business. So I think that's that's an important call to to do. Mm. All right, Daniel. Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed your conversation. And, um, well, yeah. Right back at you. I really appreciate being here and I appreciate everyone listening to us. And uh, thank you so much for getting to be on your amazing show, Heroes. All right, Daniel. Thanks so much. Bye for now. Bye.